how. Okay, so um, starting from this chapter, um, we're going to extend the basic model that we talk about um, basically for the, um, I will say chapter four and five. Okay, so it's gonna be a very simple model, um, even simpler than that, um, I would say, because we all only have um, the consumer and the government, but we will still consider a competitive equilibrium model. Okay, so it's gonna be a um, very simple model. But why we're we gonna talk about this simple model is going to be the case that we are gonna focus on a two period model. Okay, so two period is the key words here. And all the model we've talked so far, uh, well, we do, we do talk about the infinite dynamic model as well. But those models we were focusing on sort of um, the one period decision and sort of um, yeah, we do talk about saving, but in a different way though. Any case, in this case, we're gonna focus really on the sort of the dynamic part of the model. Okay, and we'll talk about a consumption and saving decision. Okay, used to be the case that we can't talk about consumption and leisure decision, right? So now there's consumption and savings instead of consumption and leisure. And we will also use that to talk about the so-called credit markets. Basically, there will be loans, uh, people loans to you, or you, you put your saving to the bank, or here actually you, you sort of, you make your saving, but the government borrow that money, money from you. Government basically issue uh, bonds to buy your savings, sort of, okay? Um, <clears throat> so, the learning objective here is we're gonna construct a consumer's so-called lifetime budget constraint. So it's gonna be really similar to the budget constraint that we already have. Okay, and there will be a preference. The preference, if you look at this at the sort of right way, I mean correct way, then you will find that the preference is exactly like the preference we talk about in chapter four. You, the, the, the meaning of the right way I will talk about it later. And then we'll show how the consumer responds to change in his or her current income, future income, and market interest rate. So think of this as there will be two periods. One period is you are a student, okay? And you earn some income right now. Right, you either earn a TA, uh, TA uh, salary, RA salary, or you maybe work for a 7-Eleven or whatever convenience store, you earn some salary, or you even get your income from your parents. That's another source of income. And then next period, you will graduate and start to work uh, on the market. And by that time, you will have a different salary, right? And the problem, the question is here is that how you're gonna optimize or yeah, optimize your consumption right now and saving right now so that you know in general you will optimize your optimal, optimize your utility. Okay, and so the problem that we we're talking about here is what happened if uh, your current income, the income that you have as a student goes up, what happened? Or what happened if you can expect that one day uh, you go to the market and work for some company, that salary is going to go up. Okay, so suppose you, 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 you now expect that you will earn uh, 50k per month after you graduate, but somehow uh, maybe this semester you learn about this new job opportunity and you already get almost get the job 
that uh, for this job, and you know exactly that the, your uh, we uh, sorry monthly salary is going to be seventy k. So suddenly there's a twenty k increase of your future income. Your current income doesn't change at all, but will that change your behavior? That's the question. And we talk about the market real real interest rate. Uh, by the way, if you do attend the seminar last semester, I mean, uh, Professor Xu Tai also talked about real interest rate or real wage. The real here means there's no sort of inflation, that kind of things uh, going on. I mean, we don't really have monetary thing here, so monetary system here anyway, so every, everything's real. So the market real interest rate is basically like a price in this model. We will see why. And then that's the consumer part. For the government part, we will also do a budget constraint. That's called a present value budget constraint. And because this model only have to, these two players, we will just then show the CE for this model. And we will explain something called the Ricardian equivalence theorem. You might have heard that um, in your undergrad macro course, um, but you might like briefly remember what that is. We will, at least within this model's concept or range, talk about what Ricardian, excuse me, uh, Ricardian equivalent theory is. And we sort of will discuss what that theory is and also help you help us understand uh, what does that mean for the macroeconomy? Okay, so we're gonna start with the consumer and start with consumer's budget constraint. In this model, we will have uh, n consumer, that's the number of consumers, and here we don't need them to be identical. Okay. By saying that they don't need to be identical, what that actually means is that their preference might be different. Their endowment might be different. Okay, so everything can be different. They are, well, basically they, they have, uh, but they, they still face the same interest rate because that's the market interest rate. So their endowments might be different. Their preference might be different. And for the current period, in this period, we have two periods current period and future period. That's the two period model. There's only two period, so current and future. For the current period, I have some consumption. I use the lowercase c here because that's the individual consumption. And I save some money. That's basically how I spend my money. I spend it, uh, I mean, saving is also sort of spending. Yeah, you, you put that into some expenditure. And then the other part you use as consumption. And in this model, there is also no uh, production. I simply just get a Y, an income that comes from heaven. And But I have to pay tax. T is the uh, personal tax, how much I have to pay as a person okay, so that's it and in the future period I also have some consumption okay and I don't have saving this time why don't I have saving I mean suppose you uh, suppose you're 99 years old right now and you know you're about to die Will you still save money for your future? Assuming that you don't care about your son or grandson. Okay. You won't, right? Because that's the end of the world for you. There's no point of saving. So there's no saving. There's only consumption. So the expanded you part that I will consume everything, basically. Consume everything of what? I still get an income in the next period. That's the white plum. And I still have to pay tax in the next period, the same as here. I use the plum here to suggest it's in future period. 
and I have another source of income that's the same saving. This S will go here. The same saving times the 1 plus the interest rate. That will become the sort of my total saving in the uh, future period, right? That's also the money that or goods that I can spend on. Uh, sorry, that I can spend. Right? So this is saving plus like my interest from last period. And this is exactly same, the income minus tax from this period. That's my budget constraint. I have two budget constraints. But actually, I can combine these two budget constraints. How do I do that? So using this, I can rewrite S into C plus minus Y plus T plus divided by 1 plus R. Simply putting this here, this here, and this down here. It's very simple, right? And if you have this S, I can insert this thing back to here. So it becomes C plus C plus minus y plus plus t uh, plus t plus divided by y plus r equal y y minus t right okay and by that i can make it looks like this i simply separate this three part apart and I put the C and C plum together, T and T plum together, Y and Y plum together. You can see here there's one C and C plum divided by 1 plus R, Y, and there's a Y plum divided by 1 plus R, there's a T and T plum divided by 1 plus R. Right? So the whole thing can be written like this. And if you sort of are, I mean, aware of the fact that uh, what is 1 over 1 plus R, that's sort of equivalent to the beta that we used before, right? So this is simply the present value of my future consumption. This is the present value of my future tax. This is the present value of my future income. So in a way, this is present value of my all consumption, present value of my all taxes, no matter it's current or future period. And this is present value for my all my incomes. So this is sort of translate into consumption plus tax equal income right consumption plus tax equal income right that in a way that makes sense right you got sort of income y from heaven and you consume some part and sorry, and the government collect tax from you. After paying those tax, you basically spend the rest because the only way you can get utility is from consumption, right? There is no other way for you to spend those income other than tax. So after paying the taxes, all those uh, are spending, are, are consumption. And so I can rewrite consumer using sort of the idea of 
lifetime wealth. Okay, I said that the lifetime lifetime wealth. I I use the term W E to be your income minus tax, your present value incomes mi minus present value taxes. That's how wealthy you are, right? The more heavy the tax are, you're more, you're less wealthier. And the more the income you get from the heaven, you're wealthier. Okay, so that's lifetime wealth. But lifetime wealth from these, these equation, you know that lifetime wealth is also equal to C plus C plus divided by one plus R. That's the present value of your consumptions. Right? That's from this equation. So that means you can do a simplified lifetime budget constraint using the so-called slope intercept form. Basically, you 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 put the one plus r, one plus r here. What you get will be c plus. This is C times one plus R, right? And you move it there so that it become minus C plus one plus R and the W times one plus R. What, I, what I'm trying to do here is W E is basically a constant, right? Because this is exogenous. This is, oh, these are also exogenous. How many tax the government will collect from me just like the so lump sum tax that i assume in previous model those are exogenous the income here is also exogenous so this is a constant also exogenous so i mean r is not exogenous but for this subject for this uh, decision maker it's almost exogenous because he pays one price right he pays one interest rate. Uh, yeah, I forgot to say R is the interest rate. So that's why one over one plus R is equivalent to beta. Yeah, uh, sort of too obvious that I forgot to say. And the reason I would write it this way is because I want to draw everything on a C, C plum diagram. So the only two variables that are not constant here are the C and C plum. And that's this. So here you can see that if my future income is zero, if my future income, uh, sorry, my future consumption, sorry, my future consumption is zero, then one plus R, one plus R goes out. And the C comes here you get C equals WE. So that's this WE. And the slope, or what happened if the current consumption is zero? If current consumption is zero, this term goes away, then C plus is WE, the, 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 the lifetime wealth times one plus R. That's this. This basically means if I try to consume everything today and nothing tomorrow, I mean, I'm going to spend exactly my lifetime wealth. Because that's by definition how much I have, right? My, in my whole lifetime. And then one plus R times that, that simply means if you save your lifetime wealth into the bank and in the next period, how much you will get the lifetime wealth times one plus R, right? You, you save money $100 and the interest rate is 0.1. Then next period you will have 100 times 
1.1. That's 110. Right? Okay, so this is WE. This is WE times 1 plus R. Obviously, the slope here is 1 plus R. Right? And there's an important point here. We say that's a point E. That's called the endowment point. Endowment point simply suggests or indicate your initial distribution of, re, uh, of after tax income. So the X will be the C will equal to Y plus uh, minus T. C plum will equal to Y plum minus T plum. In other words, you don't have saving. Your saving is zero. Then this is the budget constraint. Okay, and then we have a preference. Again, we assume more is always preferred to less, and the consumer likes to uh, diversify in his in his or her consumption bundle. Okay, we say this is consumption smoothing. But this time it's not smoothing between Consum uh, consumption and leisure. This is smoothing between current consumption and future consumption. Why do I do that? Imagine, imagine that you know for sure, okay, notice the word for sure, that suppose one year from now, you will get, um, say, one million from some guy. You don't have the money yet, right? You have, it, for, for, for your current self, nothing has changed. But you know for sure one year from now you will get one million. Okay, then it is really unlikely that you will not change your behavior right now, although nothing has changed to you for your current self. Right? There's really simple way to you to do sort of consumption smoothing. In this case, you will borrow money. You will borrow money to buy uh, games, video games, or, or clothing, or a new car even because you know you will get the money in the future and you don't need to sort of uh, you, you will not save money for now because you know your future income is going to go up right okay, that's called a consumption smoothing basically you think of the current consumption and future consumption exactly like the X and Y goods you learn from microeconomics, then that makes sense. So you don't want a lot of X, little Y. You also don't want a lot of C and little C plus. Or you also don't want, in the case I just described, you don't want your C plus to be really high and the C to be really low. You want it to be similar. And we assume current consumption and future consumption are normal goods. Remember what's normal goods? Normal means they're not inferior. Okay? So the income effect is positive. 
And again, you can draw the indifference curves. And as you can see, they are very similar to the indifference curve we draw for consumption and leisure. And again, the slope, we will call it the MRS, marginal rate of substitution. But this term is not MRS leisure consumption. This time is MRS consumption and future consumption, current consumption and future consumption. And what happened, what is the optimization? I mean, it should be easy, right? You just push the indifference, indifference curve to this direction where the utility is going up and you find the point where sort of you cannot push even further. And if your indifference curve is smooth enough, continuous to differentiable and all that, you will find that it will actually tangent to your budget constraint. And if it's the tangent case, you'll find that the MRS will equal to the slope of the budget constraint, which is the uh, interest rate plus one. And if your endowment point is below the optimization point. What that means is you somehow decrease you decrease your current consumption and increase increase your future consumption, right? How do you decrease your current consumption and increase your future consumption? That's by saving. Oh, so yeah, this word is incorrect. So you're lending money to other people, right? I mean, you might think it's better to memorize, okay, so in difference, uh, sorry, the endowment point is here. So this is consumer who is a lender. I mean, but for me, at least I never memorized this. I try to reason it with the graph, like what I did, right? So endowment points here, how come he decreased his current consumption and increased his future consumption? It must be the case that he saved. Saving is lending money to other people, right? Okay. And obviously, this is horrible. If the endowment point is here, it means that it decrease its future consumption and increase its current consumption. This is like, I know I will be wealthy in the future, but I'm really poor right now. Then I will simply borrow, right? I will borrow money from, for now. So far, any questions? Again, you are welcome to ask your questions in Chinese and either you type those questions in the chat room or you can turn on your mic and like you raise your hand and turn on your mic and talk, uh, ask the questions. Okay, so now let's talk about what happened if current income increased. Okay, 
if current income increase, my prediction is that your current and future consumption are both going to go up. Your saving will increase and the consumer will, well, well, that's exactly because the consumer acts to smooth consumption over time. Okay, the idea sort of, if you don't see the graph, what's the, what's the intuition behind this is that when your current income, Y goes up, no matter what situation you are right now, you originally have Y, sorry, Y and Y plum. Now you have a higher Y plum and the same Y, uh, sorry, higher Y and the same Y plum. So Y relatively to Y plum, this must goes up no matter what. So you're wealthier right now, but poor, poorer in the future. Maybe you're still more wealthy in the future, but relatively speaking, you are wealthier right now. Since you're wealthier right now, compared to before, you will save a little bit more money right now so that you will consume more in the future, right? Because relatively speaking, you are wealthier right now. That's why the saving increase. And why you increase both the current and future consumption? Because you will somehow find a balance point where your marginal rate of substitution of C and C funds is so that it is balanced, it is in equilibrium or in your optimization problem, right? Is you're choosing an optimal profile. And if your Y goes up and you only increase, if you only increase your C, you don't move your C plus, this balance will break out no matter there won't be there won't be still in the balance for you you are basically consumed too much right now relatively to future so it must be the case that you will decrease a little bit of your current income uh, current consumption and increase a little bit of your future consumption that's also why saving must increase if you think about it Okay, and if you see the graph, this is what it looks like. This is a case for a lender. Let's double check. That's the correct. Yeah, that's correct. This is the uh, case for a lender. So initially, my endowment points here. By saying that my current income increased, but my future income does not change, that means is going this way. So this is my new endowment point. Notice that this two line are parallel. There. They're parallel to each other because the interest rate one plus R, the slope, is the same. Okay? And my consumption, optimization uh, consumption is originally A and now at the point B. And you can see here that from this graph, what, it, what used to be my saving? My saving used to be this amount. That is equivalent to
this amount. And now my saving is this. So the, the saving must increase. And from comparing A and A B, you can see that both the current consumption and the future consumption, they both increase. So C, C plan goes up, saving increase. You might be a little bit confused. Why do I know this is equivalent to this amount? Or probably better to use the same. Like these two are the same. Because this is the same height. Right? This is the same height. And this is the same slope. And this is also the same height. So from the same height, the same slope to this another same height, this two triangle must be exactly the same triangle. That's why I know this is this. Is that clear? Might be too easy for some of you, but I want to make it clear. Okay. Okay, so what I just described is so-called consumption smoothing behavior. And do we actually see that in the data? In fact, we do see that the aggregate consumption of so-called non-durable goods and services is smooth. But the consumption for durable is more volatile than income. So the validity is higher goes up and down more severe what is durable like cars are durables something that you use for a long time and this is because durable consumption is economically more like investment than consumption the reason why they, they use the word more like investment is because they are still not counted as investment Remember, in economic, what is investment? Those are like factory, land, those kind of money they are spent. Those spending are investment. And buying a car, that's still consumption. Right? But in terms of how people think those things, when I buy a new car, I'm thinking it as an investment more, more like an investment. Okay. And... Consumption, think of this way, consumption like food or, or water, that kind of stuff. Even the economy is really bad, economy is really bad right now, I still have to consume some amount, right? You still need to eat your daily three meals or, or drinking enough water every day. You can, you can change it by a little bit, but you can't change it too much. You, you can maybe say, okay, I'm, I'm going on a diet right now, so I eat only one meal per day. But it's impossible that your average daily meal is less than one meal, for example. So the consumption can, has to be smooth over time. Even the economy is really bad or good, right? But durable, like car, I mean, if the economy is really bad and you already have a car, you won't buy, it's unlikely that you will buy a new car. You will spend money on those durable because 
those are not necessities, right? Okay, so durables are more like investment. So it's more, it's actually more volatile. So this is the actual data from the US. The blue line, sorry, the actually the, yeah, the blue line is durables. And the uh, uh, black lines are uh, GDP. And you can see that, can make it bigger. Actually, you can, can't see that I make it bigger, but yeah, in any case, you can see that the blue line is goes up and down uh, in a more severe way, more drastic way, right? But if you look at the non-durable and services, that's the uh, that's the um, lighter blue line here. The darker line, uh, red, uh, sorry, blue line are GDP. Okay. And I mean, basically, what you see here is that the lighter blue is uh, smoother than the uh, GDP. Okay. Oh, by the way, this the y axis here are both percentage deviation from trend. We talked about this before. So the reason why we talk, we use the percentage deviation from trend is because we can detrend basically. You can avoid the fact that the changing is due to trend. So most of the, the, the volatile part here is due to like business cycle. Okay. So in other words, we do have actual data support the consumption smoothing idea. Okay, it makes sense. Okay. And what happened if it is the future income that increase? Okay. If you sort of think about this through, the answer is it might be exactly the same in a way. What I mean by that? So before I said that you go in this way, so you're, um, sorry, let's go back to the other graph where they actually indicate the, the endowment point. So here I said that your endowment is going from E1 to E2, right? That's your current, cons uh, current income increase. But what happened if your future income increase and the future income increase is from here to here? This point E3 instead. If this is delta, this must be one plus R times delta, delta. Then, I mean, from high school math, you will know that this line will again, again, change to this line. So no matter the E1 is changed to E2 or E3, that's the current income increase, that's the future income increase. Either way, my budget constraint is exactly the same. And if my budget constraint is the same, my preference hasn't changed either what happened basically you do exactly what you would do so the new optimization point again is from a to b the exact same point what different is your 
uh, for example, before you might be a lender, now you might be a borrower. In other words, your saving will decrease. Okay, your saving decrease, but your C and C plum also goes up. Exactly like the case for uh, current income increase, but your saving will decrease. By the way, you should have asked me a question. I mean, in one of those previous slides, but you, nobody asked the question. So, but you you are supposed to ask the question. Mm -hmm. Like, what is? I mean. What is the saving for a borrower? If I borrow money, what do I define as saving? Actually, it is just the negative saving. So if you're initial, if you're initially a borrower, you borrow money from the future, so you don't save anything. Actually, you, your saving is negative. And if your current income increase, your saving will increase. That means your saving used to be maybe negative 30. You may go to now negative 20. That's also an increase in saving, but you are still a borrower. But if your current income is going up by a lot, a, a very large amount, you might even go further so that your saving become positive 10 then obviously your savings still increase but in this case you even turn from a borrower to a lender and obviously it could also be the case that your saving becomes zero that is also increase your saving and you become a person who don't borrow and don't lend money that's still possible that's also possible And that sort of lead to the discussion of sort of the definition of temporary and permanent income, uh, permanent increase in income. So what is a permanent increase in income? That means not just current period, your future period income also increase. Both periods income increase. What happened compared to the temporary increase? Okay. And the general idea should be the case that a consumer would tend to save most of a purely temporary income increase. What that means? Because I was smooth consumption, right? So if, there, if there's a large increase in, in temporary income increase, no matter that's future or this period, I'm gonna spend smoothly between this of this increase among these two period, right? So, relatively speaking, I will sort of save most. Understand what I'm saying? Okay, we'll talk more detailedly with the model in the uh, next lecture. Okay, so we'll have a 20 minutes break, come back at 3.30 and we'll continue from there.